name is James and I'm a paramedic student from Western Sydney University. In this short video, I'm going to demonstrate and perform an abdominal assessment on a patient in an out-of-hospital setting. Performing a pre-hospital abdominal assessment can prove significantly challenging due to a range of factors that come into play when assessing a patient in their home or outside environment, including the positioning of the patient, the influences of bystanders and distractions found in the environment that the patient is being treated in. An understanding of the structure and function of the gastrointestinal tract and abdominal organs is critical for carrying out a thorough assessment as there are many different conditions associated with abdominal presentations. For this reason, a comprehensive and careful examination of each individual patient is needed to treat the signs and symptoms and determine their cause in the effort to devise the best treatment and transport decision. Assessment starts from the moment we see our patients. A quick scan of surroundings will inform whether any dangers or hazards are present that need to be removed. Once the scene is deemed to be safe and any dangers removed, an initial assessment can take place, which would include a response, whether verbal or physical, a check for the airway, patency is usually indicated by a patient's verbal response. Knock knock, paramedic student, can I come in? Yes, I can come in. Hi, my name's James, what's your name? I'm Ashley. Hi, nice to meet you. A check for breathing, which can usually be achieved by observing the patient's chest rise and fall. Now deep breath. Finally, a check for circulation by observing the colour of the patient's skin or feeling for the patient's pulse. All right, Ashley, do you mind if I just take a quick pulse? Yeah, sure. The initial assessment of a patient begins with observing the patient's general appearance and habitus, looking out for greyness or paleness, jaundice, which is the yellow discoloration of the sclerea or skin due to excess accumulation of bilirubin, which typically presents in patients with liver cirrhosis or liver failure. It is also important to observe for diaphoresis or sweating, whether the patient appears flushed or red in the face, as well as checking for pigmentation or rashes. If the patient looks severely skinny, dry in the mouth, or there is evidence of skin turgor, it's usually an indication of dehydration or muscle wastage. When talking with our patient, it is also important to consider their mental state to rule out confusion. Following this, a thorough history should be undertaken once you have determined if the patient is primary survey negative. Taking a history requires collection of information gathered from either the patient, relatives of the patient or carers through questioning, testing and observations. This information is used to create a holistic picture of what the patient's health looks like, determine whether or not they are sick, possible causes of what illness they might have, as well as any signs or symptoms that could be alleviated with treatment. Completing a CHAMPS history is an effective means of gathering information about a patient's complaint. It involves asking the patient about the chief complaint and the reason why they accord. In this scenario, we have a 20-year-old female complaining of severe abdominal pain. Asking about the history of the complaint and how long it has been going on for can sometimes indicate the severity of a condition, as an abdominal complaint that has been going on for weeks or months is more likely to be a chronic condition in comparison to Ashley who has been experiencing severe abdominal pain for the past two hours. This can be indicative of a more serious acute condition. Finding out if the patient has any allergies will determine which drugs you will be restricted to administer during your treatment and investigating the patient's current medications may indicate conditions that they are already suffering from as well as determine if there will be any interactions between medications the patient has already taken and drugs that may be administered during treatment. Following this, the patient's full past medical history should be gathered including any existing conditions such as diabetes or asthma as well as any previous surgeries such as appendectomies. Investigating the patient's social history is also important to determine whether or not they are caring for themselves. This history process helps to narrow down the possible causes of the presenting problem chief complaint. A specific review of the body system that you are most concerned about is then conducted. In Ashley's case, we have decided to investigate her abdominal region. This will involve asking questions that are specific to the abdominal system. Important areas to consider include food and fluid intake, bowel and urinary function, as well as if there is any nausea or vomiting. All right, Ashley, have you noticed any changes in your eating habits? Are you eating more or less recently? It's been pretty normal, but I'm feeling hungry quite a lot of the time. Okay. All right, Ashley, I'm going to ask some questions about your bowel and urinary function. Some of them might be a bit uncomfortable, but they'll help us with our treatment, okay? So when was the last time that you opened up your bowels? It was just this morning. 
Okay, and was it difficult to go to the toilet? No, it's in the And um, was there any bleeding inside your stools? No. Okay, that's good. Frank blood indicates a lower gastrointestinal bleed, whereas melina or black stools indicates an upper gastrointestinal bleed as the blood has passed through the stomach acid. So Ashley, I'm just going to ask about your urinary function now. Have you been going to the toilet fairly regularly now? Yeah, it's Okay, has there been any pain or burning when you've been going to the toilet? There's been no blood? No. Nope. And no foul smell? No. Okay, that's good. Taking a baseline set of vitals is important for any assessment. Ashley's vital signs were all within normal healthy ranges for a young female adult. However, an increased temperature may indicate an infective organ as the cause of pain. Heart rate increases and a shallow or decreased respiratory rate may indicate acute sepsis, fever or shock. The next part of the assessment involves asking the patient about their pain. An easy way to do this is to use the Socrates tools. So Ashley, whereabouts is the pain located? And when about did the pain start? What were you doing? I ate lunch about two hours ago and then I headed to bed for an afternoon nap. And actually, what type of pain is it? Is it like a dull ache pain or is it feel like someone stepping on your chest or is it like a stabbing pain? It's like a sharp stabbing pain. Okay. And is the pain travelling anywhere across your stomach, up or down, across the side to side? It feels like it's travelling towards the centre. Okay, and how long ago did this pain start? About half an hour ago when I finally got to sleep. So Ashley, now that we know where the pain is and where it's travelling to, I'd just like to ask, does anything make this pain better or worse for you? So I was lying down to start with, but then I sat up and that just made it ten times worse. Okay, and so um, would you be able to tell me out of ten, one being no pain at all, and ten being the worst pain you've ever experienced in your life, how bad the pain is in your side? I'd say about seven is pretty bad. Okay. Okay, Ashley, well I can tell you're in a lot of discomfort. I'd like to perform an abdominal assessment on you, which will involve minimal pain. I have to push on that side, but it will help me work out what may be actually causing this pain for you. Is that okay? Yeah. I will have to expose part of your abdomen, and it will involve me pushing around on your stomach, as well as on that painful side. Are you happy for me to perform this abdominal assessment on you? Yep. Yeah. For proper examination of a patient's abdomen, it is important that they lie flat, with the head resting on a single pillow. This helps to relax the abdominal muscles, hence facilitating accurate abdominal palpation. In the pre-hospital setting, attempting to get a patient into this position could prove challenging due to environmental factors outside of our control. The easiest way to overcome positioning problems is to get the patient to lie flat on the ambulance stretcher. Ashley is already lying flat in the bed, enabling an easy assessment to be undertaken. Reassuring Ashley that the assessment will be quick and relatively pain-free is essential. It is always best to perform a holistic, physical assessment which includes the arms, they would be inspected for rashes, bruises or any other discoloration, the mouth for any active salivation or dryness, vomitus or fetor, the chest for gynecomastia on males, large rashes or discoloration as well as looking at the legs for edema indicative of fluid accumulation commonly found in heart or kidney failure. Inspection begins with exposing the entire abdomen whilst maintaining the patient's dignity. Carefully look for any abdominal scars indicating previous surgery or trauma. Older scars will appear white, whereas more recent scars will appear pink. Scars may be quite small, such as laparoscopic scars, or quite large because of previous caesareans in females or appendectomies. Observe for any abdominal distension which may be present, caused by the six Fs, fat, gross obesity, fluid, ascites, fetus, phantom pregnancy, flatus, gaseous distension, or a filthy big tumour. Looking at the shape of the umbilicus may give a clue if there is distension. An umbilicus buried under fat suggests that the patient is overweight, however when the peritoneal cavity is filled with large volumes of fluid, the abdominal flanks will appear tense and the umbilicus will be shallow or everted. In pregnancy, the umbilicus is pushed upwards. Localised swelling may indicate enlargement of an abdominal organ or a hernia caused by a weakening of the abdominal wall. Checking for any trauma, such as bruising, opened wound or cuts, redness, swelling, masses, distended veins or pulsations, is important when inspecting the abdomen, as well as observing for any visible peristalsis, indicating active movement of food through the intestines. Palpation can now begin. It is important to first warm your hands for the comfort of your patient. Ask your patient if any particular area is tender and examine this area last. Asking the patient to bend their knees whilst lying flat will further relax the abdominal muscles. So Ashley, can I just get you to lift your legs up? 
So now I'm just going to perform the abdominal assessment, which will involve me pushing gently on your stomach. So just to remind yourself where about was the pain was around this area. Okay, so now I'm just going to push gently with the metacarpal phalangeal joint on my hand. And you've got to tell me if there's any pain. Anything there? Okay, anything there? A little bit sore there? Okay, what about there? Okay. Anything there? So I'm just pushing gently now to start off with. And then what about here? Okay, so that's quite sore. Push there. What about here? A little bit. Ow. Okay. The abdomen is divided into nine quadrants or regions, making it easier to differentiate between different pathophysiologies due to the locations of organs below the skin. Palpation should begin with light pressure in each region furthest from the tender site, using the metacarpophalangeal joint. We always save the painful site until last and only palpate gently in order to prevent further exacerbation of the pain. As I'm palpating, I'm continually observing my patient's reaction as well as noting the presence of any tenderness, lumps or distension in each region, keeping in mind the underlying anatomical structures. I'm now going to perform the same palpation, however this time I'll push a little bit deeper to detect any further masses and define any already discovered. Now, actually, I'm just going to push a little bit deeper, same way that I was doing it before, but you better let me know if there's any pain, okay? So I'm just going to push a little bit deeper. Ow! Okay, so there's pain there. There's pain there. Ow. Okay, there's pain there. Ow. Ow. Okay, and I'm not avoiding this area just because there's already pain there. Ashley's grimace upon deep palpation infers rebound tenderness, also known as Bloomberg sign, which can be indicative of peritonitis. Other signs which may be present in an abdominal presentation include Murphy's sign, which can be identified by in spiritual limitation when deeply palpating the right subcostal liver margin, indicative of cholecystitis. McBurney's point is tenderness located two-thirds of the distance from the anterior superior iliac spine, indicative of appendicitis. Rovsing sign may also be used to conform appendicitis and is defined as pain in the right lower quadrant on palpation of the left lower quadrant, which could mean the presence of appendicitis or an inflamed organ in the right lower quadrant. Ow. Some other tests to consider include Cullen sign, which is ecchymosis or subcutaneous spot bleeding around the periumbilical region. Gray Turner sign, which is ecchymosis of the flank, both of these can be indicative of pancreatitis or retroperitoneal bleeding. Kerr's sign is described as pain radiating to the shoulder tip, indicating a splenic rupture or ectopic pregnancy. Psoas sign, caused by passive extension of the thigh, can be indicative of appendicitis or a psoas absa. Ow. For the purpose of the video, Ashley tested positive to each of these tests. Finally, to complete the assessment, it is important to auscultate the abdomen and listen for bowel sounds. Warming the stethoscope before placing it on the stomach is an important consideration to improve the patient's comfort. Once the stethoscope is placed above the abdominus, you should listen for two minutes and note down what you hear, whether it's high-pitched gurgling, and consider the frequency of these sounds. So Ashley, I'm now just going to place this stethoscope on your stomach just to have a listen. I'm just going to move it around the different quadrants, okay? But just keep breathing normally. Absent bowel sounds may indicate an obstruction requiring immediate transport. A normal bowel should sound soft with intermittent gurgling. Thank you Ashley for letting me perform this abdominal assessment. The abdominal assessment is now complete. It is important to now explain to your patient what you have discovered and what you would like to do for them. This will include an explanation of the treatment you will like to commence in the pre-hospital setting and an explanation of why further tests may need to be performed at the hospital due to the limited investigation tools available on the ambulance. A clear transport decision that involves the patient is crucial in order to provide the best care.